Renee might have found her perfect guy. Whitney is finally being honest with herself and everyone else. And Sondi is going to move on. What's good, y'all? It's your good sister, Erica Bain. Coming to you right here on Erica Bain TV with another Run the World video. And in this video, we are breaking down season two, episode number four. This one is a good one, y'all. I am really, really excited to talk about this. The episode is titled My New Therapist Says. And if I recall correctly, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. But if I recall, I think that the therapy episode of last season was the best episode of this season as well. And they did not come to play or disappoint with the therapy episode in this season there was so much context given to what each girl is going through the way they moved each girl's storyline along I thought was absolutely brilliant Whitney was actually tolerable and I think we also got less of her in this episode so you know that's always a plus and the synopsis on the episode reads Sondi Whitney and Renee visit their new therapist Dr. Monica Mitchell who helps them process the crossroads they have have reached in their lives and relationships. Now that therapist is played brilliantly by Chris Summers. I absolutely adore. It's the little black icon, not little, but it's the black icons for me, specifically the black women icons in this show. So we already had Erica Alexander in the series, you know, formerly playing Ella's boss, but they still kept her this season. She has a couple run-ins with the girls. And then now we have Chris Summers stepping in for the girls therapist who apparently has retired. Why the girl all have the same therapist still I don't know but mama is great she's brilliant and she's able to tailor her advice to each of them and what they're going through so we're gonna break this review down into each of them and what they're going through character by character and I'm gonna go ahead and start with Whitney because for me <laughs> y'all know I've been over her and she had the lightest of them all even though everybody's you know part in the episode was solid in reference for their storylines Whitney we didn't get to see much of we didn't get to see her back at work the biggest thing that we get to see for her is that she is in the therapy chair um with dr mitchell then she uh gets a surprise visit with ola sprung on her by her damn pastor and then she also you know shows up for the girls for the weed rolling class as well as when sony sends up this sos right and, you know, we get a quick moment of her donating some of Ola's stuff because she's very frustrated that she's living in this three bedroom apartment by herself. And basically one of the things that she communicates to her therapist is that she's frustrated on where she is in life. And that is also a part of it. The pastor inviting Ola and Whitney to what was supposed to be solo sessions, but then springing it on them that it was going to be basically a couple session was completely trifling. And then the pastor going on to say that they are supposed to be hashtag, um, black love goals and then telling Ola that the one thing that needs to happen right now is that he needs to forgive Whitney so that they can go ahead and move on with it so they can get back to being black love goals I was like I don't know what in the hell type of new age therapist you are but or not even therapist new age pastor you are but sir go to hell respectfully religiously straight to hell because this is trifling you're using your authority and your proximity to the lord to try to manipulate these two into getting back together when it's not even clear that they actually should be together or are good for each other in this episode whitney has to process with her therapist why she made certain decisions throughout their relationship that have nothing to do with her actually cheating and then what comes out both with the pastor as well as with her therapist is that she feels like she did all of this to be in this relationship with Ola. She sacrificed, she cooked for him, she cleaned for him, she didn't go to Stanford, she stayed around for Harvard. So that all for their relationship to be together and she felt like she had to maintain this perfect image this entire time. And I got thoughts on it, but I'm gonna go ahead and give a little gist right now, right? Um and that's something that she throws in Ola's face at this little parent trap meeting with the pastor. And it's something that also comes up for her with her therapist. And while forgiveness is the way, I feel like we still need to give Ola his time and his space to process. I don't think that he's wrong. I don't think that he's taking too long. And also, he could forgive her or move to a place of forgiving her and never get back with her. For some people... Cheating is a non-negotiable. Like me, I'm one of those people. Lord help me. I pray to God. I pray to God that a man that I'm super serious about and going to marry or have already married does not do this because I think I would be an Ola and could not recover from that. And that is okay. Whitney 
and I have said this before, I feel like she lives her life under this guise of perfection, which she spoke to in this episode again. So that makes her a little bit more tolerable because I feel like she's been running from accountability as well as running from honesty this entire time, which has made it very hard for me to sympathize with her. But girl, when you met Ola, I doubt it very rarely. Like we haven't seen this, but when you met Ola, I doubt very, very, I mean, I doubt very seriously that he looked at you and said, you have to be the perfect little, little light skinned girl for me. And then you were like, okay. And then pick up this role and decide to carry it all the way up until you cheat. And then you decide to blow up and tell him that you cheated so that you could blow up what your relationship was because you were tired of carrying this little perfect girl torch, which is what she tells the therapist. Like this is that bothers me about this because Ola didn't tell you to be perfect. He met you where you were. You started to show him a person and you kept up who that person was. He fell in love with that person. The entire time, he didn't tell you to be this person. And I think why he is so deeply hurt and why he is not able to move on. Because personally, it looks like Ola gave you exactly who he was. Meanwhile, you have been lying and pretending. And then now you want to look at it now that it didn't fall apart because you made some dumbass decisions. You want to look at it like it's his fault because he's not just going to move forward and forgive you and fight for the core of who you are when he don't even know who the hell you are. She tells her therapist that she's pissed that he didn't even want to try after after she revealed the, the cheating to him. But girl, maybe that was a non-negotiable for him. And you can't be mad at this man not loving who you actually are when you have only shown him who you were going to pretend to be. I have said this quite a bit. I have not let it go since I heard it. And I don't even remember where I heard it. But God can't bless who you pretend to be. We can't fully love people who pretend to be somebody that they're not. It doesn't work that way. And with Whitney just having this chip on her shoulder, being resentful of her life, as well as Ola's position in reference to not just running back to her after this big mistake, it annoys the hell out of me. And I think that the therapy is doing a great job in bringing certain things up, but I would love for her to not scapegoat Ola and then take responsibility for like, I actually showed you somebody who I wasn't. You fell in love with that. I started to feel stuck and smothered and suffocated under the weight of who that person is and trying to or thinking that I would have to keep that act up for the next 50 years and I ain't have it in me so I made a difficult decision to sleep with somebody else or a dumb decision to sleep with somebody else and I made the difficult decision to tell you because at the end of the day I do still want to be with you but I want you to love me for me and you know what? And just now talking about this and, and, and doing this video, girl, that is what the hell Ola was asking you for in episode two. When he asked you why and you couldn't give him a real answer, this is exactly why. This is exactly how you might get this man back. But because you can't atone and speak to this and, and stop blaming him, that's why you're not going to get your man back. And you don't deserve him back until you get to this point. Maybe it's coming in the next four episodes, y'all. But that's the tea on wendy not wendy <laughs> whitney and y'all it reminds me of this tiktok that i just saw today that infuriated me like it infuriated me so bad women like this really chat my ass and it's not just like i want to attack what i dub as pick me women Be because it's not just that like everybody has some nuance to them for the most part, people aren't trash. We might just call them trash because it's, it's like a hot take that's catchable, like an easy thing to throw out and you get what somebody is saying. Uh, for the most part, I do empathize with these pick me women, but I came across this little girl who was who was nothing, creating nothing but pick me content. And I'm going to show it here not to like flame her or anything, but just to make a drive home the point when it comes to Whitney as this character, right? So take a look at this. And then I'm gonna come back and, and tie it together. I'm gonna tell you something about men, because I think us girls don't understand this, okay? No matter how tomboy you think you are, and how laid back and cool you are, this is what men love. And men, if you're watching this, please confirm in the comments. Men love when you look healthy and youthful and hydrate. Your hair dye, it's shiny, you look beautiful, and you love it. It doesn't actually surprise me. Men love like lip gloss and curly stuff, like dancing around. But they love like cheap nail polish or clear polish or something that's light and subtle. It's so fun and relaxing. Like, it's like the way you like muscles. They love when we have our lip gloss on. It's like so cute and it's so nice. They love that. Walk around with a cute little bag or some cute sunglasses. They love it. 
Now this is something as well that I didn't know when I had to learn this. You gotta have your toes done. Men love when your toes are done. Let me tell you, either the white nail polish, the light pink, nothing bold and crazy. They love when your toes are done. Now I'm gonna say this because no, nobody's gonna tell you this. No guys are gonna tell you this. When you wanna have like your bummy relaxing days, make sure they're cute bummy relaxing days. If you've been dating your boyfriend for a while or your partner, don't like let your looks fade. So, so in this video, this girl is telling women how to do things that men like, how to be what they like, how to say what they like, how to visibly show up how they like, just so that you can have them. And when you do stuff like this, that is how you arrive in life at the place that Whitney is at. She decided to present a person to Ola that was not fully her and not someone that she could sustain all because she was playing a game of wanting to get and keep him. But then the thing that this piece of content and women like this who think like this and women who do this and the Whitney's don't take into accountability is you are creating a persona and building a life as a persona that one you might not actually like you definitely don't enjoy and you cannot actually sustain and keep it up so what the hell is the point i know i have a lot of conversations around men and holding men accountable and that can get conflated quite a bit and people who are hell-bent on misunderstanding me will make it seem like i hate men and that's not the case while I think that you can do things for your male partner, if you are a heterosexual woman who seeks relationships with men, you can do things for the men that you like or the men that you are in relationship, but shifting your whole entire identity, shifting how you talk, shifting how you vis visibly look, shifting the things that you seek out and you do in life for a man and not for your enjoyment, not for your education, not for your betterment is the dumbest Thing women can do and the sooner we stop doing it and the sooner we stop telling women to do it the sooner we will have more healthy women more happy women who are aligning with men who actually are compatible with who the hell they are which hopefully can treat them better which I'm not putting it on women to have men treat them better but at least for us, if we were, if we are doing more things for ourselves and only allowing ourselves to align with and entertain people who actually benefit and compliment who the hell we are and what the hell we want, the better off everybody will be. Point blank period. Now, I didn't want to spend this much time on Whitney, but the episode was fire and I literally came across that video today. So I wanted to tie the two together. And this makes a great segue into Sondi because Sondi in this episode is having a really, really hard time at the crossroads of trying to figure out if she's in a relationship that works for her if her partner is actually good for her or if she just has made decisions based off of something that felt right in one moment but now doesn't actually align with where she is and where she wants to go and some of the like standout things that happen with Sony in this episode and by the way y'all I absolutely thought that her storyline was the strongest I was most interested in what was going on with her like she had me from the top of the episode all the way to the end um, but some of the standout things uh, was that she told her therapist that she feels like now that Amari isn't spending as much time with them that she's actually realizing how different they are. So I'm like, okay. But then before that, she also told her therapist that she didn't feel like they were a real family anymore now that Amari's mama is back. And I'm like, okay, girl, did you want, now I need more information and more context on the family that Sony comes from. Because I'm like, girl, did you get into this with Matthew because you w desired the feeling of family? And now that that has been disrupted for you, you are trying to figure out something or now, now that has, that has been disrupted for you and you have been triggered with positive feelings around standing in your voice, gaining a little bit of notoriety because at the top of this episode, she does a podcast with this raggedy ass conservative white woman and the black male host who was trying to set her up to get some damn um viral moment and some clickbait even though she was able to call it clock it and check the both of them usher them right on up out of there she gets you know starts to get some more plus publicity and more eyes on her she had the debate last 
uh, episode and she did really well with that. The podcast spurs her to get interviewed by The Cut and she's really feeling herself. She's really enjoying that she's letting out her ideas into the world and they're being met by people who resonate with her and want to continue to uplift her voice. So now instead of focusing on Matthew and Amari and the family that they're building, she's able to be one inspired and positively triggered in this other part of her life um and i think that that is starting to push out the space that she had for the family and the timing just happens to be that naomi came back so it makes it less of a burden in reference to the family and now she wants to jump all in in reference to her brand and i guess building herself up as a personality and a commentator we don't re really know the details of that she just mentions that she likes it and then this is causing her to feel like she needs to pull back from the relationship and maybe walk away from Matthew and their relationship as a whole. But the problem comes in that Matthew, I think, starts to feel her pulling away or I, I can't really tell y'all. I'm going to keep it a buck. I can't really tell if Matthew was feeling her pull away and feeling her feel a type of way or if he got tenure and he's one of those men who like have certain things on a checklist and once he got tenure now he wants to get married again because he is right on track with what he wants to do in life. I think that uh, Sondi and the girls are like well maybe he just felt you pulling away and now he just wants to lock you down but I'm starting to lean towards the latter. We're going to have to watch more episodes to actually see but this creates conflict for her because she's about to break up with you because she's just so unsure and you're trying to move further into commitment yeah now what i will say is i don't know if Sandy should break up with him i'm like girl even if you want to slow things down like do you have to break up with him because he does feel compatible for her like he does feel like he pushes her in the right ways when he is being a little bit selfish or needy in reference to putting his needs before hers he i think he's doing a great job of like seeing that reacting to how she responds to certain things and making adjustments he's been trying to be very supportive of her and up until now i don't think that any of this is getting in the way of her pursuing her career in this way so i'm like dang girl why do you need to actually break up with him is there ever a conversation of like this is what i'm feeling can we slow down can we shift can we adjust can we spend some time and explore a different version or dynamic of our relationship i think so often maybe in life but then also in media when we're seeing these things play out once our minds change and things shift for us we don't actually get to see the process of like recalibrating our relationships we just see like oh i gotta break up i gotta end it and i would love to see them explore sony going on this other journey career wise and them trying to figure it out not just cutting it off like i think that there's a lot of meat there in reference to story but i do also respect that she feels like they're going into different paths in life and they want different things i was wondering like Sony, what do you want from the man that you ultimately want to be with? Because when she was talking about him and she was like, yeah, he just wants to be tenured and do this. It's like, girl, he owns his own brownstone. He's just become tenured at this prestigious university. He's making really good money and wants to take care of you so much so that he wants you to give up the, your damn apartment so that you can live with him or whatever. Um, and the way that she talked about, oh, all he wants is tenure and to be this great professor, whatever, whatever, an academic. I'm like, damn, are you looking down on that? Is that not enough? So then that just made me wonder, like, girl, what is it that you want from your partner but we don't know we don't get that in this episode but we get quite a bit too much on so i ain't even complaining honestly y'all yeah that's all that went down with sony for the most part i still have i'm still processing sony's story in this episode i thought it was really 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 well the entire episode was really well done but sony was really 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 well done and don't be surprised if you see other videos with me expounding upon the dissolution of a relationship when you figure out that you're not going in the same direction or you think that you're not going in the same direction it's interesting because Whitney got caught up all the way down to days before going to the altar, presenting someone who she wasn't. And Sondi has been who she is while, you know, taking on a mother role and, and maybe giving a little bit of extra effort because he came with additional baggage. She wasn't hiding who he, who she is and she hasn't needed to or felt the need to pretend to be perfect. Um, she's shown him moments of vulnerability and told him when she needed more space and time and needed to focus on her studies. And 
a certain thing. So I'm looking forward to seeing if she actually keeps this honesty up. I know she hit the apartment, y'all. But for the most part, she was very honest about things. Or at least let him see and feel. And when he called out, like, yo, I noticed something different, she actually spoke to it. So, like, not too much on Sunday. I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Now, Renee... Last but certainly not least, Mama starts this episode getting out the Bentley truck with her little lavender fit on. She got the fur and the dress. And Preston is trying to fly her to Miami so they can have Cuban. And she's just like, um, this is a little bit too much. Which is interesting because it's like, Renee, this is something that you was like basically wanting from Jason. And now that I think about it, now that I'm starting to process it, y'all. Because I'm like literally recording this and processing it at the same time. Is Renee or was Renee like dragging her feet or feeling away because she was she's getting everything that she wanted from a man? It's just not the right man because that is very real. And I have felt that before. And I literally didn't think that I was watching it. But now that I'm talking about it, I'm starting to think about that. In this episode, we get to see her still pushing, you know, the Renee Ross agency, taking uh, client meetings, new client meetings that she's trying to build. Preston is super, super supportive and has been in incorporating her into his life. They are spending tons of time together. He is sleeping over a lot. And she is starting to get uncomfortable with how easy, how beautiful, how comfortable they are becoming and connected with each other and it makes her question if she's actually ready to date and it's so interesting because while Renee could come off shallow and a lot of people were on her head last season in reference to like being pissed with Jason not being able to financially provide she's not in she could in this moment she could in this space try to take advantage of Preston um, financially and she just isn't she's literally just being a regular girl getting to know this guy and she could actually be falling for him and it's interesting because that's the big conflict of this episode of like she's really starting to like him and they actually seem like they do have a little bit of chemistry and they have a lot of fun together but I think she's also specifically for the conflict of her like starting to fall for another guy I one don't think that she's over Jason yet and then it's like, well, what do you do with these feelings when you're typically a, you know, a monogamous type of person, a, a serial monogamous, if you will. And you fell in love with somebody who like disappointed you, let you down. You decide to go y'all separate ways. And for some women, sometimes you feel like you're not actually going to find another one. And then you do. And then he also checks off more boxes than the other one did, especially for where you are at that particular point in life. It brings up a lot of feelings as well as brings up a lot of questions. And I think that that's where we're really going when it comes to Renee's storyline. I thoroughly enjoy watching her um, explain how she basically ghosted Preston because she was scared and uncomfortable, unpacked all the stuff with her therapist, but then went back. I love Preston playing a little bit petty and leaving her waiting and having her come and look for him only to have only to have the dinner ready for her to make sure that she knew without being you know nasty it was like cute petty it wasn't nasty petty um just to make sure that she knew like one he knew that she ghosted him and it's not okay however he still wants her i just thought it was so beautiful how it played out it's interesting in the choice that they have for preston i like that they picked a dude who gives very regular dude I'm like, okay. And while he, you know, is navigating the music industry and is, you know, a seemingly hood dude, he doesn't give off the overly gangster thug stereotype or whatever. I think the choice is a is an interesting choice and I and I like to see it. I think that's pretty much it, y'all. This episode was phenomenal. And if you're not watching Run the World, but you just sat through this whole video, then please go back and watch it. And don't let me spoil it for you anymore. Watch my breakdowns after you watch the episodes moving forward. It's your good sis you love to talk TV with. I would love to know what your thoughts are on the episode. Drop them in the comment section down below so that we can keep the, com the conversation going. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.